Welcome to Bible Mysteries. What if there are secrets in the Bible the world doesn't want you to know? You're listening to episode 110, The Limits of Satan's Power, part 2. Now here are your hosts, Scott and John. Scott and John here with Bible Mysteries. We want to thank you for being a listener, but we'd love to invite you to become a subscriber. Absolutely. This will only help us to expand the amount of people that we're able to reach and show the secrets in the Bible that the world doesn't want you to know about. That's right, John. And if you subscribe to Bible Mysteries Premium Podcast, you get some great benefits. Access to every current episode, the full thing, even with our interviews and any special events we do. Plus, we have downloadable show notes. We have our community forum and Slack that you can join. And we have our Bible Mysteries monthly newsletter. So for just $7 a month, you can help support us get the word out and defeat the satanic global elite. To subscribe, just go to BibleMysteries.Supercast.com. Thanks again for listening and enjoy the episode. Hello, welcome back to Bible Mysteries. I'm Scott Mitchell. And I'm John Potts, and this is the show that talks about things in the Bible the world does not want you to know. And we've sure been talking about things the the devil doesn't want them to know, right? Yeah. The limits to his power. Yeah. Uh, We got so into it last time that we had to make this a part two. Yeah. And uh, we got more to share. Yeah, more to share about that. We want to, yeah, I always feel like um, Satan doesn't want people to know much about him. Because the more we know who he really is, the less power he has. Yeah, makes sense. I even remember as a child, um, I used to have recurring nightmares. I was very young. But I had recurring nightmares about the devil. Okay. It didn't even grow up in a religious home, but somehow in this caricature of him, you know, red with horns and all that. And that's scary to a child. (laughs) And um, it wasn't until... um, in my teens, I actually went to a Bible study, and it was being preached by a dear brother in Christ, and you've heard the name, Obed Kirkpatrick, yeah. uh, who uh, first showed me the gospel in my youth. And Brother Obed was teaching on demonology, and he actually was explaining what and how demons were and how Satan operates. And I actually stopped having the nightmares once I realized it's like knowledge disarmed the enemy. You know, wow. so that's the, interesting. It was really great to finally get a piece about that because, yeah, up to that point, it was this fear of the unknown. And then once you know who he is, I'm like, oh, that's what he is. You know, well, maybe this will help some people out if they listen to this podcast. I, I right? hope if you so. understand the limits of his power, yeah, maybe it'll take some fear away from somebody who is feeling that. That's the aim. That oppression. That's yeah. the aim. And in fact, mentioning my, my childhood uh, recurring uh, dreams, um, there's a we, we need to do an episode about children and the way Satan does go after them yeah. and tries to get them young and bring them into some form of deception that he can use to cultivate them into his adults. Because we're going to find, as we saw uh, right as we ended last episode, that uh, Christ accused some Pharisees of being of their father, the devil. Mm-hmm. And I think he very much wants children from a young age if he can get them. Well, that's you know. very obvious right now. I mean, yeah. It's called our school system, right? Yeah. <laughs> In many, many ways, that's exactly I mean, what's happening. The public school system, it's, I, I don't even know what's happened there, but the wheels have flown off yeah. there. Right. And it's all by design. Yeah. You know, and through, <clears throat> through Satan's human proxies and the satanic global elite, it's it's intended to just destroy the foundation of everything God laid. Yeah. You know, everything that's good. But before we get back into those topics, we want to take another moment to just welcome again uh, our newest subscribers, and we want to call them out by name, thanking them for being a part of Bible Mysteries Premium Podcast. Uh, we're going to give a shout out to, I'm starting to think more, you know, we, we discussed the idea of what we call these members. And I'm starting to like the idea of agents. Okay. You know, the Bible Mysteries agents. I don't know if we're going to stick with that or not yet. We're still wanting to hear <laughs> your ideas about that. You we know? need some input. Somebody inputted a family, you know, and I like the idea of a family. But we're all the family of God, you know, when you're in Christ. Mm-hmm. So that's that's already there, too. But uh, I don't know. We're just looking for that. One of these days we're going to hear a word or you're going to make a suggestion that, listen, and we're going to go, that's it. 
That's what we need to be. It's like you're part of the team, or you're yeah. part of the force, or you're, yeah, you know, whatever the, the and I guess the I was thinking is. I was thinking of agents because I was thinking of like the X Files and the, I'm Agent Mulder, I'm Agent Scully. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're investigating the Bible, you know. <laughs> Maybe that works. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, the next twelve subscribers that we want to thank okay. are Nick W. We got Joe C, Jeff D, Zoe P. Natosha J, Claudia G, Pamela C, Emily S, and I hear from Emily a lot. Thank you for your questions, awesome. Emily. Kyle G, Brock G, Leonard S, and Cassie S. So again, we're saving the last names to keep their privacy, but we just want to thank you guys for subscribing yeah, and being part of the Bible That's Mysteries awesome. Premium. All this can be found, by the way, at BibleMysteries.Supercast.com. I know you get sick of John and I saying the ads uh, in between these episodes, but if you want to hear them ad-free, that's another incentive to make you want to subscribe. So back to the limits of Satan's power, John. Um, we looked last week and we wrapped up the episode with Christ telling some Pharisees in John chapter 5 that ye are of your father the devil mm -hmm. and the lust of your father ye will do. And so we, we left this idea that while Satan is limited in his power, he works through human proxies, and he has children to do some of that work. Yeah. And they're children not by genetic birth, but by their alignment with him. Okay. And we'll see another example of that in Matthew chapter 23. So let's turn to Matthew 23, and we'll dive right into the scriptures. One, one of the ways that we try to be different from other podcasts, <laughs> even though we're all kind of on the same side of the equation of trying to show these unusual things and the way things are being fulfilled in the end times and the revelation of paranormal and whatnot. So we try to focus our attention on the scriptures as much as possible because that's my background as a Bible teacher. Yeah. And so we, if you know, um, I did an on the patio um, short, which we give to our subscribers in the newsletter. And I recorded one today because I get a lot of... Um, Comments, questions, information, uh, requests, uh, or requests that we do a podcast on the flat earth. And yeah. I, I just address that in this little five minute short because I want people to understand that I, I don't believe the earth is flat. And I don't want to discredit anybody that does. Uh, we can agree to disagree, and I'm happy to do sure. that, you know. But I, I gave some of the reasons for why I said that. And um, one of the one of the arguments that they make in favor of it is that, you know, it's a great conspiracy for Satan to hide the truth of the earth being flat. And my thing was, well, how does he benefit from that? I see how he benefits from hiding who he is. Yeah, And definitely. I see how he benefits from hiding his agenda of fallen angels if they're UFO, what other alien yeah. abductees. I see how he benefits from hiding the global leaders being part of the satanic global elite. But if the earth is just a flat disk, how, how does he gain from that? He doesn't benefit anyway. So, and I, I was saying, if, they, if, if I thought that was true, I'd be all over it as a conspiracy. You yeah. Know, I, I want, but I can't find the scriptures to prove that. So if we can't find scriptures to prove something, I'm not going to try to make a deal out of it. Yeah. Because it's, if it doesn't, if it's, if it's not convincing to me, then it's not convincing. Well, to your else. point, that's what separates this podcast apart from other podcasts out there and not yeah. that other podcasts aren't right. Great. Right. There's a lot of them Absolutely. that we support mm -hmm. um, and that are biblically based. It's just that you, if it's not in the Bible, if it can't be proven by scripture yeah. or researched in the Bible as the number one source, then it's not really worth talking about am i i hope i'm not misrepresenting you there no i would agree with, with you 100 percent, john okay. that's exactly my feeling about it you know it doesn't mean that the lord may not reveal some truth to me Absolutely. and i will down the road yeah. come to say oh i was wrong about that maybe the yeah. earth is flat or maybe there is this or that but i'm not going to try to prove something that i'm not convinced is true and the way i've got to be convinced is from the scripture and when we talk yeah. about something like that topic i'm not trying to harp on the flat earth but it's just one of those topics where they throw a lot of scripture out you to say, no, this proves the earth is flat. And I read the same verses and I don't see that, hmm. you know. So if it's that open to ambiguity, then either one of us doesn't yet have the right understanding. Yeah. You know? So I leave it open to the Lord still can correct our understanding. Hmm. Yeah. But anyway, back to the subject of limits of Satan's power. We do have scriptures to show where he can and cannot operate. And in Matthew 23, if we start in verse 28, 
Jesus Christ said these words, again, to Pharisees. In the context, verse 27, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, and he calls them hypocrites, which they were. And in verse 28, he says, Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. And remember, John, last week you commented that even a person who's just maybe they don't acknowledge God, they don't believe in God, they're not outwardly worshiping Satan, yeah. but they're just interested in money or accumulating wealth or doing this thing or that project or whatever it might mm -hmm. be with no attention whatsoever to God. They're also aligned with Satan yeah. by denial, by... Um, disobedience to the Lord, whatever, yeah. you know. But in this case, you see that clearly these guys are outwardly appearing as righteous, not just, you know, running around being atheists, but actually uh, trying to present the idea that they're in God's favor, that they're actively mm -hmm. working for the Lord like Saul was before he became the Apostle Paul. He was the enemy of Jesus Christ, yeah. Saul of Tarsus. Mm -hmm. So he says in verse 29, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchers of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? So he wasn't calling them serpents just to insult them. Yeah. He was calling them serpents because he said back when, in John, you are your father the devil, and the devil is a dragon. He is that old mm -hmm. serpent. Yeah. So they're little snakes from the father. And they're that way, not through birth, uh, genetic manipulation necessarily, but they are that way through identification through alignment with this teaching, this theology. And that means it might be not alignment with their practicing occult things like Aleister Crowley was yeah. or someone like that, but they're literally in defiance against the truth of God, even though they think they're doing God's service. That's a scary thought. It is kind of, it's kind of perplexing, in fact. And it just goes to show you the hold that Satan has when we, when we read that he has... Uh, the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. The darkness comes not necessarily because you run around and participate in a, a witchcraft activity or a coven or something. Yeah. But it comes when you just refuse to acknowledge the truth of the scriptures and what God said. And even it might be a religious, legalistic, Christian appearing thing. Well, it's still satanic if it's not the truth. Yeah. So Satan's hold on people is through all of these mechanisms. It's not just the obvious. And that's, that's why I brought that thing up about being a child and having dreams and of, of, of the devil in the caricature that I think he probably made of himself. Red, scaly, with a bifurcated tail and a hay fork, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing uh, is sort of like you would, if you, if you met him in a dark alley, you'd run. And yeah. then you'd run into the open arms of this beautiful glowing angel that you think is your protection and your solace. And that's actually Satan, yeah. you know, in the form of this religious system or this governmental agency or whatever. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, he's a master of deception and a hmm. master of disguise when you think about it. So interesting. often in the podcast, we've talked about how there's nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. That which has been will be before. So the past reveals the future. And I think there's something to talking about being children of Satan and through alignment doctrinally, through alignment, through belief or unbelief, you know. Yeah. There can be children of Satan in another way as well. And so when we talk about the limits of his power, it's limited up to a certain point until human proxies relinquish control and dominion of the earth, he's going to gain more power. And ultimately, as we saw in the episode where there's going to be a war in heaven, he's going to be cast out of heaven and confined to the earth. He's going to exercise the fulfillment of that power until the Lord comes back to destroy it. Okay. And I want to talk about that fulfillment and the way it might come to fruition. So go back with me to Genesis chapter 2, and let's look at the past and see if it can shed light to the future. 
So in Genesis chapter 2, we get another account of, or maybe some more details about how God made man and what he did. He formed him from the dust of the earth and things like that. And then in verse uh, 23, after we see that how God actually formed the woman, Eve, by causing a deep sleep to come upon Adam, mm -hmm. taking a rib out of the, an operation is what he did. You know? yeah. So he, man, yeah. he made man from the dust of the earth, but he made woman to come from the man. Yeah. Hence the name woman means of man. But when he did that, verse 23 says, Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. So God had a reason for why the woman, which would become Adam's wife, Eve, was taken from the man rather than creating her separately from the dust of the earth like he did Adam. Yeah. You know? So by extension, she's made from the same dust because he was. Mm -hmm. yeah. But she was literally formed by God through an operation of him going to sleep taking his rib and forming from her a woman. And it says she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and they shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Now the apostle Paul expounds upon this in Ephesians chapter five uh, and how that he said, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. He cites this passage and he applies it to Christ and the church. So clearly it has a connection to the family of God, mm -hmm. to Jesus Christ as the head, the body as the bride, the city as the bride, which is yeah. later, and all that. <clears throat> now, if we think about that then and the spiritual significance of that, and we think about how this relationship that God ordained is under attack today, transgender, yeah. gender blending, uh, gender denial that a yeah. man can be pregnant and have a child that's just a denial of science that's a denial yeah. of nature uh, and yet you've got governmental officials going on the record health officials saying oh yeah a man can be pregnant or or that foolish woman that was a, a, a candidate for some court maybe Supreme Court I don't know who said I I don't know what a woman is I'm not a biologist I can't define that. You remember somebody saying I, something? I think she's on the Supreme Court. <laughs> oh, did she? Yeah. Did can, she make can, it? Can, oh. Can Johnny? I forgot her last name. I think wow. she's on the Supreme Court yeah. now. I mean, that, that's just the most foolish thing I've ever heard said. I, I, yeah. I don't. I can't define a woman. I, I'm not a biologist. Yeah. You know, that that was a political statement. That oh, had nothing yeah. to do with what she truly knows. Sure, she knows know? what a woman is. She, of course, she knows what a woman is. <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyway, it, it just shows you how much Satan's influence has gotten into our systems. Yeah. Okay. So adding all that together is the word cleave here. Okay. So you think about the word cleave there, and I think of a, what comes to my mind is a cleaver. And I, I use a cleaver to cut ribs or meat or something. Yeah. And ribs. <laughs> no pun intended with Adam here. <laughs> I was thinking of barbecue ribs, not, not creating a woman. <laughs> Uh, but you chop up a steak or whatever with a cleaver, yeah. you know, and so to me it separates things. But here it's used to join together. A man shall cleave unto his wife mm -hmm. and they shall be one flesh. So obviously words in English over years have changed somewhat. You know, yeah. we used to say the word fat meant bad and now fat is good, you know. <laughs> so I, I, I don't understand that, but, you know, whatever. So go to Genesis 6, and uh, we're going to segue here into this thought I want to carry forward. Because remember, we're talking about the limits of Satan's power. Well, one of the ways he's attacking mankind is through the very idea of genetics. And God set up humanity to procreate through a male and a female cleaving, coming together, yes. joining and becoming one flesh, because they produce a child. Mm -hmm. And while there's a spiritual picture of the joining together of Christ and his church, through a man and woman coming together, they produce an offspring and therefore the fulfillment of God's commandment to be fruitful and multiply yep. and replenish the earth. Well, obviously the angels took note of that because the fallen angels saw that could be done and then they thought, hmm, maybe we could participate in that. So Genesis 6 verse 1, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair or beautiful, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, the first indication of a wife was Adam and Eve. Yeah. 
The first recording of a marriage was done, not through a ceremony, not through a church, but through God presenting Adam, his wife Eve, and the two became one flesh. Mm -hmm. And they were joined together. They were married. She's called his wife. And later on, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived to bear a son. Right? Yep. So they took wives. There's something interesting about that, but it at least shares the idea that they were involved in procreation in the same way that a man or a woman could. Mm -hmm. So obviously, if an angel leaves his own habitation and his first estate changes, he can take on the ability to procreate or at least pass seed to a woman who can then conceive. Well, he can take on the form of a man. Right. For he took sure. on the form yeah. of a man in order to do that. And uh, verse 3 tells us, The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. And I think that had to do with the timing until the flood, that, yeah. that man would live 120 years. And that's how long it took Noah to preach and build the ark. But then it says, There were giants on the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they, they, they bear children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. So once the after the sons of God came down to the daughters of men, they produced giant offspring, yeah. Nephilim hybrids that were part human and part fallen angel. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth as a result of this union. Man became yeah. even more wicked than he already was, sinful. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, led by the influence of the angels. Yeah. And we'll see a little bit of that maybe when we come to talk about the unclean spirits in the book of Enoch, because the yeah. Bible doesn't give us specifics. So we have to go to some non-scriptural references yeah. to get some ideas. But verse 6 says, It repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And I think it's a beautiful picture to think that God has a heart. Huh. You know? Yeah. God has a heart. I had never thought of that. <laughs> yeah. So the sons of God took the daughters of men and they cleaved unto them. They took them wives. You can say all day long if you want to about the word took them wives. And in the Hebrew, it's a violent taking. It's a taking by force. So we could say that they grabbed them and raped them. Uh, I'm not so sure that's exactly what took place. I think there was an alliance made. Mm -hmm. uh, I do believe that during the days of uh, um, the, the children of Lamech, from the line of Cain, Tubal Cain and Jubal yeah. and Naama, yeah. that they there was an explosion of technology. So they probably exchanged their sisters for technology. Yeah. You know. Uh, in a ceremony of some kind. Like Satan loves worship and he loves ceremony. So there was probably a, something going on there that's a little different than just seizing and abducting. Yeah. Now maybe they're doing that now through extraterrestrial type whatever, UFO things. Yeah. But uh, in this case it looks like they made a contract, if you will, okay. like a covenant. Not saying it was a God-honoring marriage. I'm saying it was a way to unify so that they could produce offspring. Yeah. Now, so it's that word cleave that I'm interested <laughs> in. And we're going um, we're gonna to go back to um, that in Daniel in just a moment. But go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. One of the very striking things that Jesus said about the times of tribulation is found here in verse 36. He was describing all types of things about the last days, the times of Jacob's trouble, what we call the great tribulation. And he said in verse 36, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. <clears throat> but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the son of man be. So in some way, He's telling us that the, the second coming of Christ in the time of tribulation is like the days of Noah. And we're going to apply that same thought about as nothing new under the sun. Yeah. The past reveals the future. Verse 38, he gives us a clarity. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also be the coming of the Son of Man or so, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be, all right? So in other words, it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah when I come back. Well, the only reference to eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage is in Genesis 6. Hmm. Okay. 
in the days before the flood, there was nothing stated about marrying and giving in marriage except for the sons of God taking the daughters of men. And nothing is said at all about eating and drinking unless it's in conjunction with the marriage. So hence the ceremony I was talking about. Yeah. There was probably a, an alliance, a contract, a unification of men offering their wives, or rather their sisters, we should say, yeah. uh, at, at, to wife so that these fallen angels could take them to conceive children because they wanted the exchange of the knowledge. Yeah. They wanted the dark wisdom. Uh, and then the women wanted the notoriety of having birthed leaders, men of renown, yeah. mighty men, the heroes, Hercules, Atlas, all of that. Titans would have been uh, what they, uh, the Greeks called the Golden Age, but in fact it was mm -hmm. a time of horrible oppression and, and um, uh, cannibalism of, of these Nephilim giants eating men and corrupting all the sciences so that mankind went down the path of dark knowledge the dark side, if yeah. you want, you know. And so that's what he's referring to there. And I think a passage in Daniel chapter 2 alludes to it. So let's go to Daniel chapter 2. Now let me ask you a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, but as in the days of Noah were, so also shall be the coming of the Son of Man, right? So that's telling us as it was when, when Noah was around, that's what it's going to be like before Jesus comes back. Correct. Right? Right? Whereas in the days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage, right? So then you just made a point that um, it wasn't the fallen angels that came down and abducted or came and did mass rape of human women. That mm -hmm. there was actual contracts or agreements between fallen angels and human men. Yeah. Hey, give me your sister and I'll show you how to make weapons of war. Give me your sister and I'll show you how to do whatever, yeah. the, whatever those occult arts were that they were teaching them. Uh -huh. Right? So if that happened then, right, in the days of Noah, that's going to happen again? Yes. Right? So if that's the case, marrying and giving in marriage, that do you believe that that will happen again? Like men will actively say, you can take my daughter yeah. to someone that they know is, uh, I don't even know how to describe phrase it like someone that they know is non-human or and here's I, here's where we get into the scary part of genetics hi if you're enjoying this podcast please consider being a full-time subscriber we are going to use these funds to expand the message and get the word out about what's in the bible that the world doesn't want you to know about that's right john we appreciate you listening but we'd love it if you'd subscribe that way we can reach more people with the time we have left so enjoy the rest of the podcast, but think about subscribing if the Lord puts it on your heart. To subscribe, just go to BibleMysteries.Supercast.com. Thanks. Nice. Okay. You're, you're, you're dancing around the, the pen. There. Yeah, I don't know how to describe it, but you know where I'm going with I that? do, I do. So here's what I think. The, the very idea of the limit of Satan's power is we've seen he can't just do anything he wants. Yeah. Man has dominion of the earth, so man has to relinquish that power, relinquish that control, and mm -hmm. give it to Satan through a voluntary contract, through a worship of him. And once the entire world gets back into that realm, if you will, into that system, and, and it's through this great reset in the world yeah. economic form and everything, then he's got permission to go further in. And if he's going to be confined to the earth through that battle that's coming, the war in heaven, Mm -hmm. then all the more reason he would be fulfilling this thing. So talking about genetics, which we're getting to, I would argue that man devolved from the type of, of his genetic purity in the days of Genesis 6 yeah. to where we are now, and that it's very likely that angels can't just willy-nilly interbreed like they did in Genesis 6 to produce Nephilim offspring because we're not, they're not capable. We don't have the genetic capability. Or perhaps maybe even they have lost some genetic capability. Hmm. Fallen angels. Yeah. All right? However, if, and if that is the case, that might be why the genetic abductions, uh, uh, UFO abductions are taking place. Genetic experiments. Hmm. Okay. Have you ever heard the expression about waiting to find the red heifer? No. Okay. <laughs> that is... Uh, there's a lot of belief that there's going to be, when the scripture says there's going to be a temple rebuilt and yeah. they're going to do sacrifices again during the time of tribulation. Yeah. 
and that they can't implement the sacrifices until they find the red heifer, which was used originally to dedicate the first temple okay. or the first tabernacle. And I don't know what it is about a red heifer, but they, there's always, every time I turn around, I see some news about, oh, they found the red heifer, they found the red heifer. And then yeah. in a week or two, the temple's going to start to be built. And every time they've ever said that, I never see any activity on the temple. You know? <laughs> <coughs> so perhaps, <coughs> excuse me, and then they take a moment to drink. Yeah, I see stuff on social media or something where people are like, oh, the, they found the five red heifers. Or yeah. It's always like something like that. And I have no idea what it's about right now. There I'm seems like, to be something about that. And uh, so I'm thinking that what if, yes, they need to find a genetically pure red heifer to implement the, the temple built building okay. and, and the, in the, uh, um, <clears throat> the dedication of the temple and all that. Well, Satan's always emulating God. What if he needs a genetically pure human with which to produce the Antichrist. Hmm. And uh, his fallen angels need some genetically pure humans, or at least genetically capable of fathering Nephilim hybrids. Yeah. Okay. And they don't occur naturally anymore because we've devolved as yeah. humanity yeah. from that state of genetic purity. So they're trying to manipulate that to produce a human being that's capable of interbreeding with a fallen angel. Yeah. So they, they can produce maybe the Ten Kings or a Nephilim hybrid or <clears throat> the Antichrist. Or is it possible that it's not, they're not capable of genetically being restored to a condition of conceiving from an angelic seed to produce a hybrid offspring? Yeah. So that the experiments of abductions are going to be able to produce them genetically in a laboratory. And therefore, they're not going to be marrying and giving in marriage as they did in the original contract. Although a contract has to be involved, mankind's got to give permission to yeah. come in. Uh, but when they do, and I think maybe there's something to the fact that the government back in the 50s said you have permission to take people for your experiments if you give us this technology. Yeah. If you give, and, and okay, you can reverse engineer it, but we're not going to tell you how to build it yourself. So they put these UFOs at Wright-Patterson and they've been trying to reverse engineer all this technology, allowing angels, fallen angels, to abduct people through their proxy greys and reptilians or whatever they might be. <clears throat> and they're trying to produce a hybrid that will look just like a human being, but be able to uh, be involved in the transfer, the proxy transfer of title of the earth, okay? And that's why if we go to Daniel 2, I think that's what this passage means. It's just my speculation about it. But when we talked about the Roman Empire, the, the two yeah. legs of iron in Nebuchadnezzar's, Nebuchadnezzar's image, I can't say the word, verse 40 says, and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. The power, the strength, the military prowess of, yeah. of the final Roman Empire under the guise of leadership of the Antichrist. And whereas thou sawest the head, the feet and toes, rather, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron could that be the fallen angels? For as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, man's made from the dust of the earth, yeah. miry clay. Pot, Israel, Israel was told by God, I'm the potter, you're the clay. So uh, it's very possible that <clears throat> these ten kings might even come from Israel. And I'm talking apostate Israel. Hmm. And I also believe that the Antichrist is going to be an Israelite too. Yeah, a, An apostate Israelite, you know. Verse 42, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And there's the word cleave again. The same word that was yeah. used about Adam and Eve. A man shall leave his father and mother, cleave unto his wife, marry in a contract, and unite to produce children. 
they're not going to cleave with one another. I believe they, in the context, is the fallen angels. And they can't just join together as a man and a woman can do. And through, to me, I see the gender blurring agenda, the mm -hmm. transhumanism, all of that impacting that. It would appear to me that fallen angels won't be able to cleave or procreate directly with humans again. Could this be part of the, that agenda of transhumanism, transgenderism? Direct genetic manipulation will require an artificial mechanism. So, for example, women can become men through an operation. Men can become women through an operation. It's not true, but that's what they're doing. Yeah. Well, that's opening the door to maybe eventually, instead of surgery, they're going to be able to do it through mRNA, genetic manipulations and wow. things like that, and introduce into them <clears throat> the alien seed, the fallen angel seed that's going to turn them into hybrids. You don't think that that, <clears throat> I'm just throwing this out there, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, saying that there will be genetic manipulation. Well, that's what that's saying, right? Right. <clears throat> but they shall not cleave one another, meaning... If there was a marriage contract proposal uh, back in the Fallen Angels of Genesis 6, there, it, that's no longer the case here. There's no cleaving one to another. Yeah. So it could be just alien abduction. Yeah. It, it, it's That's what I'm the, saying. That, that whole relationship is out the window yeah. at this point, right? They're no longer it, needing to do that. It's because It's done in a laboratory. It's because done, yeah. instead of individuals saying, here's our sisters, you can take them to wife yeah. in exchange for technology, it's entire governments saying... Here, take whoever you want. We don't care because we don't care about them. Give us the technology and you can abduct whoever you want hmm. and produce whatever you want to do. And ultimately, uh, there's some government leaders that say, as long as I'm in on a piece of the action, yeah, make me a king, make me a this, you know, the love of money, the root of all evil. Wow. It's sinister. When you when you start to really break this down, I think it's extremely sinister that Satan is getting to the point where he's going to get the whole world under the control of human proxies that can then turn around and surrender permission for mm -hmm. him to come down and fulfill the fruition of, you know, pr pr producing these hybrids and ultimately producing the Antichrist. Interesting. Yeah. What were you saying about Wright-Patterson Air Force Base? Oh. That's where, allegedly, the uh, crash-landed Roswell craft was, was taken to Wright-Patterson? Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. where my dad used to work. Yeah, that's where they reverse engineer things, <laughs> yeah. supposedly, in a deep underground base somewhere. No idea. You, they, they alluded to that in the movie Independence Day when um, they took them down and they showed them the, the spacecraft. That was, yeah, it was under, yeah. underground or something like that. Yeah. It was kind of hovering. Oh, they took the things off and they sat yeah. there hovering. So right. it still worked, right? Yeah. <laughs> They, they tried to figure out how to, to run it, but they didn't know how. You but know? Will Smith jumped right in and started yeah, flying. Yeah, of course, <laughs> because he's such a great pilot. <laughs> yeah. He could figure out alien technology. <laughs> All right, sorry. No, you're right, though. That, that's exactly it. And, and once again, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I think fiction... Science fiction starting all the way back with like Jules Verne and mm -hmm. all the way up to Star Wars and George Lucas and everything. They're telling you what's real in the guise of fiction. I don't literally mean there's an Obi-Wan Kenobi and a yeah. Luke Skywalker. But I mean that it's, it's all an allegory of what's actually going on. <clears throat> My wife and I went back and actually started a binge watching the X-Files from the first episode. Uh -huh. And I'm astounded. Back in the 90s, and they're talking about things that are that are all being revealed today, you know, yeah. and the truth is out there, right, you know. But uh, th they were already discussing these things. It's, Satan wants us to know what he's doing, but in, in the symbolism that he produces, yeah. you know. He wants the worship, remember. And he wants to gain this power. So go to 2 Thessalonians. We'll, we'll hopefully wrap this one up here in just a moment or two. Second, thing, it's, it's just a fascinating to think about. We could just go forever on this stuff, you know. Uh, but chapter 2, verse 1, Paul talks about the revealing of the Antichrist. And he says in verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So he's trying to uh, uh, put at ease the Thessalonians who are fearful that they might have missed the rapture. Okay. And he says in verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Well, he's called the man of sin because he is part human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, 
so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, like a Caesar, like okay. an emperor, yeah. right? Uh, Satan has a man of sin who's going to be his final proxy that's going to literally gather an army together to fight Jesus Christ when he returns. He says, verse 5, remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. And what he's saying is we're holding back the revealing of the Antichrist. We being the body of Christ. Yeah. All right. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, the Roman Empire. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That's the body of Christ. Yeah. And then shall that wicked be revealed. That wicked is the same one as the man of sin, the son of perdition, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And again, it comes down to belief and unbelief. The ones who are going to receive the, the uh, strong delusion are the ones that don't believe the truth of the gospel today. And they're going to believe this man of sin is God, mm -hmm. is the Messiah. The Maitreya that, uh, uh, that Sylvia McKelvey yeah. was speaking about in Storm uh, on the Horizon. And so one more time, go back to Revelation 12. And I want to show you something we, we mentioned that battle, that the war in heaven between Michael and his angels and Satan and his angels. They're going to be cast out, all right? And when they come to the earth, that's when he empowers the man of sin, that wicked, the Antichrist. And notice in verse 12 there, we read this part, Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. When the heavens are cleansed of the Satan and his angels, there's going to be rejoicing in the heavens. Wow, okay. But look at the rest of verse 12. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And if you go back up to verse um, 9, it says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil. That means he's cast out of his realm now, heaven. And Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So they're confined to the earth as well when he comes down. Hmm. His angels will ultimately be confined to the earth, and he says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Yeah. That means that's when he unleashes, all hell breaks loose. Yeah. Verse 13, and when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she should, uh, she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times, and half a time from the face of the serpent, and of course the serpent is the dragon. So that's the Israel that believes. That's the one third mm -hmm. we discussed from Zechariah, and they're going to be the ones that the Lord uh, gathers first when He comes back. Uh, they're going to be out in that wilderness to the east of Jerusalem. And they're going to join him to come up uh, from the south into Jerusalem where they engage in the battle with this man of sin, the Antichrist. Uh, so Satan is still operating through his human proxy there, this time fully empowering him, you know, having entered into him. But the good news is they're not going to win. Look mm -hmm. at the end of the battle, if you will, in Second Thessalonians chapter 1. <clears throat> And we'll see the end of Satan's power. Not the final end, because there's going to be a thousand-year period where he's confined and released for a very short time. But we're going to see the end of this Antichrist and this battle that's going on and of the sat satanic global elite. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. And you who are troubled, rest with us. Here's the comfort. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints, will be with him, and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So Christ returns with his angels and his saints to destroy all unrighteousness, 
including Satan and his angels and their spawn of these yeah. genetically manipulated hybrids or whatever you want to call them. And so even today as we speak, in the book of James chapter 4, and you don't have to turn there. Yeah. Well, yeah, let's do it. Let's turn there because we got time. Go to James chapter 4. And it's a passage that's used a lot, but I don't think it's always quoted properly. Um, it's right after the book of Hebrews, James 4, and starting in verse 7. And James writes, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So we have a promise of knowing that the devil, his powers are limited when we resist him and we submit ourselves hmm. to God. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, be uh, ye that, uh, that are double-minded. And so the idea is drawing nigh to God. You know, we should be praying constantly for yeah. God's protection uh, against the fiery darts of the wicked. Yeah. Uh, the shield of faith protects us from that, too. But we, we, we ignore to our peril the spiritual realm that is against us that we wrestle not with flesh and blood. Because Satan does have power, but there's limits to his power. He cannot do to you what God won't allow him to do. Yeah. So we should be in constant fellowship with the Lord, praying for his protection, praying for his wisdom, praying for his uh, provision, so that we can carry out the work that needs to be done. If you're not serving the Lord, if you think about it, you're no threat to Satan. He doesn't care. He'll, he might give you the desires of your heart, or he might uh, get you uh, in in some sort of an addictive trap of some kind yeah. to keep you distracted or, or, or involved in a in a uh, in a in an entanglement of some kind, maybe yeah. a political action that seems really good, but occupies all your time and is not advancing the truth of the gospel. Th that's one of the reasons why I brought up the thing about the flat earth. I think that that's an entanglement. It's a distraction yeah. from what needs to be said. If we're just trying to, if they're making that our hill to die on, that's that's not winning people over to Christ. You know, it's just a big discussion. It's diversion. Yeah, it's a yeah. diversion. So I, I would encourage everyone that hears this to think about your relationship with the Lord and whether or not you're in that mantle of protection and that you're praying for God's uh, protection on you uh, from the spiritual realm because if you're engaged in the battle, you are a target and you need every ounce of God's yeah. protection and shield of faith. So I hope something about what we talked about today will give you some encouragement that while Satan has power, there are limits to his power and his power stops where the Lord Jesus Christ begins. Yeah. Well, there's good news in that, right? Amen. <laughs> Amen. And good news that the battle ends in the in the right way. Yeah. You know. So once again, we appreciate you tuning in to Bible Mysteries and hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Hey, thanks again for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast episode and we so much appreciate you sharing with others and your friends and tell them about the show. And we'd also love it if you'd one more time consider joining Bible Mysteries Premium Podcast as a subscriber. Absolutely. And keep in mind that your subscription helps us get the word out to as many people as we can possibly reach. So we appreciate you partnering with us. Don't forget, it's BibleMysteries.Supercast.com. And thanks again for joining us today. Thank you for listening today. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to Bible Mysteries and share it with a friend. If you want to learn more, you can go to Unlock the Bible Now. That's utbnow.com.